Bernie and Jack, guys that are great in the industry. Um, thank you for doing this for us. Uh, you know, I, you know, in the Philippines, you know, we have representatives here that come usually for scotch, right? You, mm -hmm. Yep. I think I've met one person in the bourbon industry that worked for a different brand. He was a master distiller for a different company. We don't have to mention their name. I don't, I don't sell their stuff. <laughs> I, live, I probably lived down the street from him. Who was it? Oh, what's his name? I, you know what? I should know his name because I have his bottle signed. Um, oh, that's the, uh, he works for Buffalo Trace. Guy with oh, a mustache. Arlen Wheatley? Maybe. I should get the bottle later before uh, when we when we stop recording and I'll take a look. It was either Harlan Wheatley or Elmer T. Lee. So uh, no, no, it's too. not Elmer. No. <laughs> Does Harlan have a mustache, Bernie? No, he doesn't. Mm, I don't know. I'll look it up later. Uh, you were there? Awesome. Were you there, Jigs? Mm, no, I don't think I was. I, At, um, no, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Anyways, so no, this is great. You know, because you know, being an American. You know, and having a lo I love scotch, don't get me wrong, but there, I have this natural affinity for American whiskeys, right? Yeah, but the, uh, it, it, as Fred No used to say, uh, he'd say that the reason scotch tastes so good is there's a little bit of bourbon in it. That's <laughs> true, because the barrels, that mm -hmm. is true. Oh no, <laughs> what am I talking about? I did meet another master, dist a master distiller. I met the guys, um, the, the new master distiller for now, Jack Daniels. Um, okay. And Arnett, who just, yeah. who just announced he's, he's leaving and retiring from there. And, and he's just probably just waiting on the telephone for a, for a half a million dollar a year job to call him. Yeah. I'm sure. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I also met uh, the master distiller of Wild Turkey, of course. Well, of course, Jimmy Russell and Eddie Russell. Yeah. yeah. Great people, you know. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I figured they'd be over there because they go to Australia, and I figured they would be stopping over. Yeah, they did. he did a big Asia tour a couple years ago. It was a big party. Mm -hmm. I've, You know, it, it's interesting to see a six-foot-five gentleman, or however tall he is, <laughs> you know, uh, put back some and walk a little gingerly, you know, mm -hmm. over time. That's uh, – yeah. Well, we all know each other. We all get along. We all, uh, you know, the, the salespeople, they're the ones, uh, our owner, you know, that's one thing you'll learn about Heaven Hill is we are still family owned and, and family operated that our owner said, you know, our salespeople will fight for the last, you know, spot on a, on a liquor store shelf, you know, to, you know, tooth and nail for it. But we all get along in the industry because uh, the way I put it is that uh, Jack Daniels, uh, sells as much as the entire bourbon category combined. So we have to kind of stick together to, uh, to, 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 uh, to make it in this world. Of course. I think, you know, we all do. Uh, when I talk to some of the other, um, other uh, websites and other distributors, there's so much space. I mean, everyone, you have to fight off in the Philippines. It's really Johnny Walker, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the amount of whiskey those guys sell is amazing. And let's be honest, their product is pretty good too, right? I mean, it's, absolutely. you can't, you can't be that big and not have a good product. Of course. Absolutely. But with, with Evan Williams, or I should say the Heaven Hill brand, you guys have such an eclectic, but yet at the same time, amazing products. How does Hev Heaven Hill as a company do that? Oh, well, first of all, I'll tell you, I, so I'm Bernie Lovers. I'm the global brand ambassador for Heaven Hill Distillery out of Louisville and Barstown, Kentucky. And that's my, my teammate and compatriot, Jack Choate. And he is the ambassador for Heaven Hill Whiskeys out on the West, West United, uh, Western United States. And hey, so, everyone. Yeah, it's great to be here. And, and uh, so the way it happened, uh, Frank, is, is, it, it wasn't a big plan. It wasn't like they planned it out. Um, and it's, it's really cool to get these stories right from the horse's mouth. So uh, I hear Max Shapira, and as I said, you know, we're, we're family-owned, family-operated. Max is about 77 now. He, um, he is the second-generation owner of Heaven Hill Distillery. Um, and so you have 
prohibition, okay, which we were not in business for prohibition. We, uh, I, nobody was. Uh, there were only six companies that got a license to sell medicinal whiskey uh, for prohibition. But our, our, our family owned department stores in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, Louisville, uh, they call the Louisville stores. You all say Louisville, and that's the city that I live in, Louisville, Kentucky. But since I'm local, I say Louisville. Okay? Uh, and so they were called the Louisville stores, but they were in small little towns in Kentucky, um, kind of like the Walmart the model, you know, like the big cities coming to you. Okay, so the Louisville store and the people's store. So the interesting thing about prohibition is there's people who, who uh, were out of work for 14 years, and that's the distillers. And then there's people who weren't affected by prohibition, and that's the people who had money at the end of prohibition. So the distillers were out of money. They needed to go to try to find seed money uh, to get into business. So members of the Beam family came to our uh, family and asked them to, to uh, invest in this new venture. And Jack and I, we always joke around because we always hear different amounts that the family uh, invested in. Well, look, just to make it easy, uh, we'll stick with what Jack and I have decided, $17,500. So they invest, that's a lot of money to me today. So uh, I can't imagine 1935, that, that's a lot, that's a whole lot of money. And then, so Harry and Joe Beam start making whiskey for us. And, uh, you know, and, and so the Beams, they're a very prolific distilling family. Uh, there's some people who generations of doctors or generations of lawyers or policemen or fire firemen. But, you know, here in Kentucky and in the Beams, they had generations of, of distillers. There's more than, you know, there was dozens and dozens of distilleries and you can only, you know, so there's, there's work available for if you have a large family. So Harry and Joe Beam are our first distillers. Uh, and so we make our barrel, the first barrel, December 13th, 1935, which was a Friday. And here in the United States, Friday the 13th is, a, is, is like a, supposedly a bad luck day. But uh, for us, it's a good, it was a good luck day. So we were still here 85 years later. Uh, so they make, a, uh, they make barrel syrup, but we wanted to go for bottled and bond whiskey because that's what was, was known, as my dad used to call it, the good stuff. So you wanted to, uh, it's, it's hard to reach all of the regulations that bottled and bond, and we can get into that later. But uh, so that means it had to be aged for a minimum of four years. So we sold our first bottled and bond whiskey uh, in you know, 1939 then. So, and that's called Old Heaven Hill uh, is what uh, that brand, and there it is right there. So that's wow. Old Heaven Hill, and that was just, a, this isn't a bottle from 1930 or 40 or whatever, but yeah. this, Shows you how we do not change things at Heaven Hill. This was just around just, until just a few years ago. Yeah. So that was our flagship brand. And then uh, you had World War II breakout, 1941. And we have uh, to, we got contracts to make high proof alcohol for the war effort. And I don't know the science and technology because I'm public publicly educated in Kentucky. I don't know how that works. But uh, you can make parachutes and other things from high proof alcohol. So we had just gotten our whiskey onto the shelf in 1939. 1941, we're off, right? And there's a four year gap. So after World War II, uh, the family had bought the original, uh, the, the original uh, beam faction had to sell off their portion of the of the company to the Shapira family. So the Shapira family is in total control until to this day. And they just had other investments and other things that just didn't go right. And they brought in uh, Earl Beam from over at uh, Jim Beam, uh, Carl Beam's brother. He said, well, why don't you go? There's a, they're looking for a master distiller down there at Heaven Hill. Why don't you take our yeast strain here from Beam, go down there, and so after World War II, so we hadn't made whiskey for four years. That's kind of the new modern, you know, so, so that's, that, that, that kind of puts an exclamation point on, so it's Earl Beam who starts making whiskey uh, after World War II. And then uh, we, uh, we knew that there was another conflict that was stirring up uh, or in Korea. 
And the distillers decided, well, we're going to, we're not going to be stuck, uh, you know, with, 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 with without too much whiskey. We want to make all so much whiskey before this because they're going to ask us to make whiskey for the war effort. And the, uh, the, the government never came to them. Technology had changed. They didn't need them to make high proof alcohol, but they had ramped up production to such high levels. Now there's all this whiskey around. And after prohibition was over, that's when your Johnny Walkers, your Doers, your J and B, your Cuddy Sark. Remember all these? You probably still have all these brands over there now. A famous Grouse. They had never had prohibition, so we had to wait four years to get our product on the shelf for bottle and bond. And they had a four-year head start on us. Then they had, you know, everything in place, so World War II didn't bother them as much, and uh, especially for our markets. And then. We had another thing that happened in the United States in the 1960s, and that was vodka and tequila come into the United States. So imagine never having to deal with those. And then, of course, Canadian whiskey was, was flowing into the country during, uh, right after Prohibition, too, because they didn't have a Prohibition. So it made us slash all our prices and made our whiskey look cheap and not as desirable. And uh, as, as Max Shapiro says, it almost sent us to the great liquor store in the sky. Wow. So this is the, here, here, here comes finally the answer to your questions. But I had to give you that background so you would understand what's going on. Now, keep in mind, okay, there's the big four. So we call them the big four. So it's the big four companies that were, that controlled almost all of American whiskey. And then you, so that was, uh, that was Seagram's uh, out of Canada. So that's VO, Canadian whiskey. And they also made uh, uh, Seagram's five American blend and Seagram's seven out of, uh, out of Lawrenceburg, Indiana. So that's, some of you all might recognize that city. A lot of rye comes from out of there. Uh, so that was one of the largest distillers, dist uh, uh, distilleries in the, in the world at the time. And so, uh, so Seagram's, and then you have Hiram Walker, who had Canadian Club, and it's a monster, so it's one of the big four. And then you had Shenley, which had brands like Old Stag and uh, oh, tons of uh, stuff. And then you had National Distillers, which was Old Granddad, and at the time, the number one selling bourbon in the world, which was Old Crow. So those were the big four. So when, all, when vodka and tequila come in, and then we have all this too much whiskey left over. And the interesting thing, and this is something that when Jack will probably tell you too, of, uh, which was, what's interesting when you buy brands is you get inventory. You get all the barrels that come to, to feed that brand. So if you have the wherewithal and you're big enough and financially stable enough, what a great opportunity to build your, your, your distillery by acquiring brands from other distilleries and you get all that inventory. You don't have to make that whiskey for several years, right? You get all the inventory for all the years. So because Heaven Hill was a different situation, because we still owned the department stores, so Heaven Hill Distillery was kind of a, in the United States, when you have a, when you have a second little job or a part-time job on the side, we call that a side hustle, okay? So this was just a side hustle for, for the Shapiras, really. Um, but they were financially stable enough and they started acquiring brands, you know, as well. So they didn't get the top, you know, they didn't get, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the big powerful brands and that kind of stuff, but they, they bought brands. And so they, that's when we acquired brands like uh, Pikesville Rye out of Maryland. That's when we acquire, acquired brands like Rittenhouse Rye, JTS Brown, JW Dant, T.W. Samuels, Mellow Corn, Corn Whiskey, Georgia Moon. Right? So we acquire all these brands. And what a genius way. You get all the inventory, so we don't have to ramp up production. See, if you want to make more whiskey on your still, you've got to put in fermenters, you've got to put in another still, and that's millions of dollars of investment. But if you buy these brands, you have a few years before you have to make your mind up of what you got to do. And you have... Eh, kind of guaranteed sales. You know, J.W. Dant is going to sell 
you know, 100,000 cases every year, you know, unless you screw it up. So, uh, so we, that's why to this day, we have such a wide and varied portfolio is because of those acquisitions and where companies like Beam Suntory and Diageo and Brown Foreman, they have to pick one or two brands and really hammer it home like Johnny Walker and Bullet and Jim Beam, right? And Jack Daniels. And they've got to push, push, push because they've got stockholders. So they've got a lot of pressure on them to make money. So they have to make those million case brands and then 2 million case brands and 5 million case brands and 20 million case brands or else they're in trouble. Their stock price goes down, whatever. Well, we're not, we're family owned. So Max says, well, shoot. Um, I think last time I looked, I think Jack, if you know something different, uh, I think Mellow Corn's about a 5,000 case brand for the whole, you know, for the whole world, right? So, um, He's happy with that. That's 5,000 cases, right? And uh, we got another hit out of the barrel. So it's kind of like found money to Max. He doesn't, he's like, you know, we're here to sell every barrel. So we, we certainly, we have, we have three whiskeys that are our main uh, focus. You got to have, we are in the bourbon business, not the bourbon charity. So you got to run it like a business, right? So we have Evan Williams, uh, Elijah Craig and Larceny are our three brands that we look at whiskey wise to push. And then we have uh, Evan Williams Bottle and Bond and Rittenhouse Rye uh, that are kind of a little focus. And then we have, so I call it the engine that pulls the train, Evan Williams. That's our Jack Daniels. That's our Jim Beam. That's our bullet, right? It's the, it's the, it's the engine that pulls the train. If, that, if the engine stops, the train stops, right? So the Heaven Hill train is pulled by Evan Williams. And in the, as we call it, the coal car, which has the fuel for the, for the engine, we have Elijah Craig and Larceny, and then we have the train, right? So that's Barrel Proof Elijah Craig, that's Parker's, right? That's Pikesville, that's uh, J.W. Dant, J.W. Uh, uh, J.T.S. Brown, Bernheim Wheat Whiskey, uh, Mellow Corn. So that's the train, you know? And so when you look at it that way, it makes it easier for me anyway, and hopefully for Jack, but he can tell you his own story, but... Um, that's kind of Heaven Hill in a nutshell on how we have such a diverse um, portfolio, why we make five different styles of American whiskey and everybody just makes, you know, one of something or two of something. We uh, just, we want to sell everything and, and we're ready. If, if, what if, what if we always joke to ourselves, what if corn whiskey is the next rye whiskey? We're ready. We got mellow corn, right? So that's kind of story. If you got, Jack, do you got anything you want to add to uh, whatever I left out? And it was such a long-winded answer. I doubt I left anything out. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think you, uh, I think you covered it all. I was, I was definitely ticking off. I was ticking off the boxes on everything to make sure you di didn't miss anything. And I, you know, I think the, the one I'm thing that I would add, Oh, there you go. I, I'm, I'm sitting in the wrong place. I'm about as far away from my bar as I can be in the house that I'm in. Uh, I think the one thing that I would, that I would add to that, just sort of reiterate what Bernie was just saying, you know, it's like, you know, any of the numbers that we throw out, the brands that we throw out, you know, I don't think any of that was, none of that was necessarily foresight, right? It wasn't like, all right, 1935, where are we going to be in 85, 84.75 years, right? It just sort of happened that, we we did things in our opinion the right way i i think that you know as bernie talked about the five shapiro brothers who had the louisville store and the people stores you know they were taught by their their dad to offer the best quality product at the best possible price um and that's still what max and his children who, who are running the business still do today and you know by doing that over the course of the last 84 years following what his dad and brothers did you know, these opportunities have presented themselves and, you know, you talk about, you know, the old Fitzgerald brand and the, and the Larceny brand, you know, weeded bourbon just sort of fell into to Parker Beam, Parker and Craig Bean's lap in, in the, at the turn of the century when we acquired those brands, they had never made it before. And they were like, shoot, all right, let's go. We got it. We'll figure it out. Wow. See you guys, the knowledge, I mean, I read, and I see why Bernie is called the whiskey professor. I mean, we literally just had 10 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just guessing 10 minutes. But we just had a 10-minute lesson on not just 
the Heaven Hill brands, but history, history of bourbon and American whiskey. I mean, uh, it's amazing. I'm, I'm a man. I love knowledge. You know, I, I went out and got my graduate degree. I mean, I love knowledge. So hearing this, hearing and the passion that comes from you guys, both you guys, is amazing. You can tell you guys love what you do. You really oh, do. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, 9.26 and I'm having a bourbon. And that's all right. I was, I was just about to say that, that <laughs> we, I mean, we're, we're constantly pinching ourselves and, you know, especially now during the pandemic, you know, Bernie and I haven't been in the same place uh, for, for what, about nine months, I think, but we'll be sitting at a bar and we'll just sort of look at each other and be like, can you believe this is our job? Cheers. <laughs> Cheers to Max and the family and everyone. I mean, it's, and the industry and to folks like you, because if it, you know, if it wasn't folks like y'all that have really helped push bourbon to where it is today, I mean, it may not be our job. So, I mean, doing stuff like this and being able to tell you all the stories and being able to have stories that are, that are true and a hundred percent is, is, is wonderful. And, and to have these great whiskeys to boot. I mean, look at all the whiskeys behind Bernie. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, you know, honestly, I'm surrounded by whiskey myself. And just on the other side of the room, there's whiskey. If I go downstairs, there's whiskey, right? I mean, it's a great job. It's great industry to be in. But then that leads to me a great question, right? Great stories. How did you guys get into the industry? I mean, you get a lot of people, they always ask me this, right? They always ask, how did I get in the industry? And of course, they always ask brand ambassadors. You know, in Scotland, it's different. You're like, you're born at, right by a distillery. You either go work at a hotel that where, you know, for people that travel to see distil um, distilleries or you work at a bar or you work at the distillery itself, it, it kind of hand in hand. In the U.S., it's different. How did you guys get into it? Well, I'll, um, why don't you go first, Jack? And then, uh, okay. so, then, I'll, then I'll go after that. Great. I mean, I, I think the the theme that you'll hear from both of us is we were both sort of doing something that we love and uh, we we kind of fell into it. I mean, I don't think what you said, Frank, is, is totally incorrect about American whiskey. I think there are a lot of a lot of people in and around Bardstown and Kentucky and, and Tennessee and the major whiskey markets that, you know, have got have been in it their whole life. But for me, I was I was. 32 years old before I actually got into the business. Um, I'm from the I'm from the southeast of the United States. I'm from Georgia originally, and you know I'm one of those folks that you know tells the the joke that's mostly true about their you know mother putting whiskey on their gums when they were teething at whatever <laughs> month you are. So whiskey's whiskey's been a part of my life forever. Um, my parents gave me mint julep, personalized mint julep cups when I graduated from high school. Um, so I was, I was randomly paired up with a gentleman on a golf course um, and he was carrying actually a Dewar's branded uh, golf bag. And I started talking his ear off about whiskey, about spirits, et cetera. And How do I get come one of them golf bags, right? Yeah. That's right. That, to be honest with you, that, that, was my, that was my focus. My dad, uh, before I started working for Heaven Hill, my dad's nightly tipple was a Dewar's and water. Um, on the porch. And I was, I mean, I was trying to get a golf bag. Um, long story short, I followed him into the parking lot, very, very gentlemanly like um, after our round and said, Hey, I don't want to overstep the bounds and the rules and of gentlemanly conduct in golf. But, you know, after talking to you, I'd really love to, um, I'd love to take you out for a drink and see if you could help me get into the industry. Um, and seven months later, um, I was working for, um, a distributor and then about a year after that I, I joined the sales team at heaven hill and then um bernie and i developed a friendship after getting to know each other when he came to see me in in san francisco and, and meet our bars and i um, just kept talking very regularly i developed the same sort of close relationship with our former master distiller denny potter and when this the position came to be when bernie needed a right hand man on the on the west coast i i jumped at it Left-hand um, man, because the West Coast, it's the left-hand man. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I've been in this. I've been in this role uh, as Bernie's left tenant, if you will, 
uh, <laughs> for going on close. Uh, it'll be two years, I guess. Uh, or no, this is my third year. I can't remember. There's there's a lot of whiskey involved in what we do on a daily basis. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's been it's, it's been great great journey and uh, for me I did the you know I had no idea I was going to be in this business uh, so from 1985 to 2005 I was a professional touring stand-up comedian around the country so I I traveled off to 160 cities all over the United States and so part of my my closing. Uh, one of my closing jokes or routines was about my father and my father drank a quart of bourbon a day. So that's, uh, and he, he drank uh, uh, this brand right here. Wow. Six year old 90 proof, which we still have in Kentucky today, but uh, he drank a quart of that. And of course that's what he told his doctor, you know, so, you know, that was a lie, you know, he drank more than that. So he was lowballing it, let me say. But, um, um, but anyway, uh, so I, I, I had a whole routine. It's like a 10, 10, 15 minute routine about my father, you know, that, uh, that he wasn't gonna die. He was pickled, you know, he was, he was not going anywhere. That uh, once, the, once the embalming fluid hits his liver, he'd sit up straight up in his casket and say, now this is top shelf shit right here, right? You know, so, uh, you know, so. It, <laughs> routine about my dad it was really funny and I'd always have the crowd <coughs> I'd say hey order a shot of uh, bourbon and we're gonna not on me but on your own tab <laughs> you know the, and then we'll do a toast to my dad and I had a, I, I did music in my act and so I had a song I wrote about my dad uh, and funny song about how much he drank and all that and at the end we, we did a toast to my dad at the end and a guy who worked over at Jim Beam he heard that I did this. So if I'm going all over the country and talking to a couple thousand people a week, you know, because a comedy club seats about 200, 250 people a night, uh, and, and I'm standing up in front of a bunch of people on a microphone, he saw that there was, there was, uh, you know, what, what if he gave me shirts that had a brand on it, you know, and if I stood up on stage, of course, I thought it was fun because it looked like I was sponsored by, you know, the biggest bourbon in the world, and they were just giving me free, free shirts. Uh, but still, and they would invite me to different tastings, you know, to stand behind a table and talk. I didn't get the old Fitzgerald Prime. Yeah. I like, that. yeah. So the, uh, uh, so so uh, a couple of years go by, and then uh, they said, "Hey, we got a job coming up," and I didn't know. Here's one of the most important things: if you want to be a brand ambassador, and there's a lot of people that do. Um, when you go and people invite you to go to a tasting or you're standing behind a table and of course there's free whiskey everywhere, right? See, you know, that's part, that's part of what they're looking at. Can you hold your liquor? Can you drink whiskey all night long and not get drunk, not get belligerent, not get overbearing, right? Uh, that's part of the deal because that's kind of what you got to do in this job. You got to be able to 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 uh, drink, drink, you know, drink, uh, you know, I say responsibly. Although a lot of things that we do, you know, aren't normal. You know, the amounts of stuff that we, we do, of everything that we do, travel, drinking, whatever. You got to be able to handle yourself. So I guess I passed that test because they asked me to inter interview for a job that was um, that was doing events and promotions around the state of Kentucky in 2005. So I started in January of 2005 in this industry, not coming, just coming from, you know, my, my dad worked at a brewery uh, and my grandfather was one of the founders of that brewery right here in Louisville, Kentucky. But my dad drank beer and, but he drank, oh, he drank bourbon, of course. Uh, you can't drink a quart a day and, you know, that's kind of a job almost uh, to drink that much. Um, so, so I grew up around both. And so, um, so as, as I'm going along, but I didn't have a long history in it, uh, but I noticed when I got into it, this was 2005, I'll tell you how, how much bourbon was not selling in 2005. So I'm working for the world's largest bourbon company, Jim Beam. Uh, they're based out of Chicago because that's where the money came from after prohibition. Right? And uh, now of course, Chicago and, and Japan. Uh, so one of the big vice presidents, and I'm telling you, I mean, Jim Beam's a great company with great brands and, and whatever. I mean, I'll never, there's, 
every company makes great whiskey and has great people. It's, it's, a, it's a great industry. But this vice president comes up to me during orientation and boy, they roll the red carpet out, you know, because, and he says, um, and everybody was hired. This was a whole national program. People in every state was hired to do events and promotions in their state. And uh, everybody had budgets for, uh, oh, there's Red. How you doing, Red? Uh, everybody had budgets for vodka and rum and gin and, uh, and whiskey and whatever. But because I was in Kentucky, I just had a budget for whiskeys and bourbon. And a vice president came up to me and goes, hey, where are you? And I said, I, I, where do you live? And I said, I live in Kentucky. And he goes, oh, that's awesome. He says, but it's too bad um, you're, you're on the whiskey team. Nobody's drinking that. So that's, that shows you how depressed the bourbon market was in 2005, was that he was apologizing to me that I wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to be as exciting a job, I guess, whatever. So uh, it was just a couple years later, though, and then I learned that, um, and then I, once I started into it, I realized that the people in the industry had just let it go. Like the salespeople, they didn't really care about whiskey as much because it didn't hit their numbers and they weren't, they weren't making as much money on it. So vodka was selling so huge, and that's what they really cared about, vodkas and rums. And so um, I was like, boy, I think I can exploit this. You know? I want to do what Fred No does. You know, Fred No is Jim Beam's great-grandson. And so I, 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 here I am at Jim Beam, and I get to work with Booker No's son. Right? I get to work with the great-grandson of Jim Beam, who has all these stories and all this knowledge. I'm a stand-up comedian. I can stand up in front of people and make an entertaining talk. But what if I, what if I learn my own stories and I bring to life in a much more kind of fun, entertaining way, the boring facts of making whiskey, right? Because it is pretty boring to talk about the science that happens behind it. But there's other things. And so that's when I first started looking and, and talking about teaching people words on labels. Like if you know how to read words on labels and I was given the standards of identity by Jerry Dalton, who at the time was Jim Beam's master distiller, the first non-family master distiller. And he goes, son, if you don't know these, you don't know shit, right? And I go, huh? And to this day, Jack will tell you, I don't go anywhere without a copy of those standards of identities that make bourbon, bourbon, whiskey, whiskey, corn, whiskey, corn, whiskey, straight whiskey, straight whiskey. And I've, I have pounded it into Jack that he should carry them around and wherever he goes, because it is true. If you don't know what, if you don't know the basics of what you're talking about and because they're laws and they're kind of complicated, you got to carry them around with you. Yeah. And you got to refer back to them. So, you know, I am big and that's, and of course, that's when I found that, um, the words bottled and bond. And of course in Kentucky, and that was my dad. I remember my dad saying, Oh, bottle and bond, that's the good stuff, you know? And he really did all he knew was hundred proof. And that's about as far as he got. But that's when I started saying, you know what I'm going to do? Here's how I'm going to make my mark in the, in the bourbon world. I'm going to bring back the focus on bottled and bond. And I made that my goal. And because, you know, I don't make any of this stuff. I, my family's not involved in any of this stuff, but that's what I can do. And, of course, it takes years and years and years. But I think, I'm, think I did pretty good on that one. I think now people are looking at bottle and bond and looking at how important it is and, and, and all that. And, and you know, I, I knew that I was traveling all over the country. And then I started going when I joined um, uh, Heaven Hill in 2012. Uh, they hired me away from Jim Beam. Um, and it was the same guy that hired me at Jim Beam and he came over to Heaven Hill, right? So I just, I'm just following him around. Uh, but um, when I got over here, they had so many bottled in bonds. They really embraced the fact that I loved it so much. And I don't think I, I could have done half of what I've done um, for bottled, with bottled in bond without having phenomenal brands like Mellow Corn and Rittenhouse Rye and Evan Williams and uh, Henry McKenna, which is not in the international market. But course uh but brands like that so that's how i got into business that's how i look at it and if anybody wants a job in the industry and i just got asked this the other night how do i get a job 
is a brand ambassador. And I'm like, or like Jack, you know, who got a job as a, in a salesperson and distributor. That's sometimes how you get your foot in the door. And I said, you know, I think it's pretty easy. But it does take some, everybody says, oh, well, why don't you just, I'll just drop your name, you know. They think that's all it takes, you know. And that is not, it's not who you know. It's who knows you, you know. Because you can know somebody, but if, what if you're, you're the, a jerk, right? Yeah. You know. They're not going to hire you, but it's the people that know you, that like you. So what I tell people, if they want to be a brand ambassador or if they want to get in the industry, the best thing you can do is go to every supplier's events. Go to every distributor's events. Because there's tastings, there's brand ambassadors everywhere for every kind of spirit, everything. And if you go to every single one, then sometimes, you know, that, that distributor salesperson's there or their manager's there, but they're going to notice who shows up to events. And then if you, if, if you keep showing up and talking to people and making it known, hey, I'm looking for a job in this industry. So just like Jack did in the parking lot with the guy with the golf bag, you know, you got to do straight, have to raise your hand and say, I am looking. But you also are being noticed that you go to everything. And all we do is try to put together a short list of people to interview when a job comes up. And if you go to everything, you're going to show up on a lot of short lists. And you're going to be invited to, to interview. After that, it's up to you. You know, you got you to gotta knock the interview out of the park, right? You got you to do good in that. But I think if you do that, you can, you can get a lot of calls on a lot of short lists. Wow. Yeah, no, very true. And one thing also, you know, as mentioned before, you know, I was doing podcasts and I was, I end up being, doing, uh, doing master classes or I like it on tastings versus master classes because having sure. an MBA, being a master is really in depth. So I like them tasting. Yeah, yeah. Master like, class is so international. You know, I can go to I can go to a Paris, France, and if you say you're doing a tasting, they won't show up. But if you say you're doing a master class, oh, oh. True. So it's just so funny. It's like when you're an ambassador. Jack and I joke about this and other people. You know, my title is whiskey ambassador at Heaven Hill. But people will say, are you global? And I'm like, well, oh. I don't know. My title's not global, but I, you know, um, you know, and I said, is, is covering the United States, 330 million people, is that not enough for you? Uh, do, I, do I need more? You know, so if you want me to call myself global, because I've been to Europe a couple of times, sure, I'm global, Brandon. <laughs> but that seems to somehow put you. I call Bernie global. <laughs> yes. So, yes, I'm global. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, Bernie and yourself, Jack, you guys are proof that being a brand ambassador isn't just about knowing your stuff. It's about entertainment. <laughs> like, if you are a boring mother, right, no one's going to listen to you. And I've, yeah. and I've seen guys like that. Oh, you know, they, they come over to the Philippines to do a talk because they work for a brand. But they're not a brand ambassador. They're not. They're like head of sales or something. And they're just sure. boring. But I mean, people, I think I was, because I could be an entertaining person when I want to be, I guess, you know, that's how you get ahead in this industry. You got to be entertaining. You got to have a personality that people enjoy. Maybe not the CEO, the CEO, they could do whatever the heck they want. Yeah. But or a distiller. Yeah. If you're a distiller or a master, you know, a master blender or whatever, you get that 15 minutes, right? In comedy, we called it 15 minutes. Of uh, if you're a celebrity, if you've been on, if you're if you're Howie Mandel, right? Or if you're, uh, you know, Howie Mandel can come in on, and just pop into a comedy club and be invited to go up on stage, and because of this celebrity, you get the crowd gives you 15 minutes, and they're just kind of wide open looking. Oh my God, it's Howie Mandel! But after 15 minutes. You have to deliver and you have to be funny. You still have to do that. And I've seen, that's one reason why today I noticed the only ambassadors when I started in 2005 were distillers. 
the, you know, Fred No. It was Fred yeah. No, it was Jimmy Russell and Eddie Russell. It was the actual distillers. It was Jimmy Rutledge. It was Elmer T. Lee when I started. He was there. They were the ambassadors. Yeah. I was one of the, the first people who weren't a distiller or a family member to be, in a, to be hired as an ambassador in this whole industry. And so I was like, well, gosh, <clears throat> you know, they're not, I, I got to use my talent and my experience of being able to get up in front of a crowd and talk and capture people. And I can use that to my advantage because I don't have the stories and the knowledge that they have. But then I did find something. I found the words on labels because Jimmy, uh, because um, he had given, the master distiller had given me those were, you know, the, the, the standards of identity. So I found something nobody else was talking about. And then I turned that into and wrote a entertaining but informative program. And then the brand manager for Knob Creek in the small batch, Booker's, Baker's, Basil Hayden and Knob Creek, she noticed, and that's when they saw a little uptick in the whiskey sales was in the small batch part. And then luck has to be on your side too in a comedy, a good timing, Fred No's picture was going on the side of the Jim Beam bottle as the seventh generation distiller. And he was going on a whole worldwide tour of, uh, to Australia and everywhere, uh, all over the country in the world uh, to promote that. And they wanted somebody to talk about Knob Creek and the small batch and he was gonna be busy for a whole year. So that's when I got hired internally to be ambassador for Knob Creek and the small batch. Oh, wow. Yeah, but uh, Bernie and Jack, aside from the connections that you build before getting into the job, is there a uh, is there a certain personality trait that you think ambassadors have in common that helps them be really effective in doing what they do? I mean, I think being outgoing and being a people person. Um, the you know, living in San Francisco, I think we we sat down and counted it one day. I think there's something like eighty something brand ambassadors prior to COVID that live in San Francisco and the common trait amongst, you know, the majority of us, at least the ones that are, that are always out in events is that everybody, everybody is a, is for the most part, an extrovert, at least when they walk in the, at least when they walk inside the, the open doors of a bar or the open doors of a, of a, um, of a whiskey show, right? You know, who knows how, the, who knows what's actually going on maybe inside of their mind. They could be scared out of their mind, but as far as I know, the people <laughs> that I see yeah. are extremely extroverted and they want to be there talking about it. It's like, it's like, um, I think Frank said when, when he first asked us sort of the, this, this line of question is it's like, you know, we, Bernie and I both sort of present happiness of our, of our job. And I think that's a common, I think that's a common trait. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and I don't think you have to be boisterous, but uh, Jack's yeah. right, you have to be an extrovert, but you don't have to be an in your face, you know, high energy talker either. You know, you can, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of comedians uh, that um, use the, uh, uh, a, 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 a very powerful, but quiet. Um, who's the guy that, um, uh, shoot, uh, he was a, uh, a uh, great famous comic that uh, years ago, but he hadn't been around for, I'm, I'm trying to think of it, but there, there's like, like Bob Newhart was an old comic, oh, that, yeah. you know, that was quiet, but just so funny, but so commanding, right? And then you have, uh, so just think think about something, so you don't have to be boisterous, but it, it doesn't hurt if you are, but you can do it. So even if you don't have that in your face uh, stuff, but that's why it was kind of cool. We, you know, we, we called ourselves the whiskey professors when we started at Jim Beam. And I didn't like that title because I, at the time, I didn't think I knew that much about whiskey. So how am I going to be? And Fred No told me, well, hell, you know, most, you know more than everybody, anybody that's going to be sitting in your audience. And that's all you got to do is know more than that. And he goes, and you got my phone number and, and you can text me and I, you know, and if you on something. So uh, I'm like, well, hell yeah, I got, I got Booker No Son in my phone. I, I, I got, I, I'm, I'm, I got a, I got a call a friend, phone a friend. So uh, <clears throat> that was cool. But having the whiskey professor, to me, that was a character. That was the superhero that I played, right? So it wasn't Bernie Lovers, right? 
it's the whiskey professor. And I figured out, this is in comedy, you try to sell yourself. It's hard to say to an agent or a, or a club owner, I'm really funny, you need to hire me. That's what you need a manager for or an agent, but that costs money. And so unless you're a big time person, but it's hard as an individual to go, you know, hey, I'm really funny, you need to hire me. But I realized early on in this industry, this is the, this is the star. So as long as that's the star, I can be the sidekick behind it to bring it to life. And so my, you know, I was a little, you know, the whiskey professor is a little bit arrogant about, uh, you know, how, how much he knows and, and, and all that. And in, in a funny way, you know, just like, I, you know, tongue in cheek of, yeah, just calling myself global. I got more, I get, I get more credibility, you know, even though it's, I'm the same person, right? I, you know, what, what, no matter what you call me. And Jimmy Russell told me early on too, you know, because I'd see them, we'd, we'd all see them at the whiskey shows and the bourbon festivals and stuff. And they recognize the people that are going around and not talking bad about other brands just to get ahead. You know, we never talk bad about other brands. We, it's uh, you know, you never know. You might buy them tomorrow. You don't want to, you don't, you don't want to talk bad about somebody and then you own them. Right. <laughs> and all of a sudden you look bad, you look bad that all of a sudden I've been bad mouthing this for four years and all of a sudden it's in my portfolio. I hope that's Georgia Moon, by the way, that you're drinking. So the, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Attaboy. So, um, uh, but Jimmy Russell, uh, he, um, uh, you know, when, when he came up to me and he said, um, and I said, well, Jim, he, he said, how are things going? I said, well, it's going pretty good. I said, I just don't, you know, I, I feel a little intimidated. I don't, you know, I, I don't know everything. And every, he goes, he goes, Bernie, I've been doing this for 50 years and I don't know everything. And he goes, and I learn something new every day. He says, this is the whiskey business. You don't get it all at once. You just can't read a book. And that's when Jack started on my team. I was just like, you know, you don't have to know everything. Read, read a few of these books, mine too, right? <laughs> and, I, and I wrote my book, not as a expert. I wrote a book to learn more about the industry. And that's the, that's the uh, tract I took. But he was, that took a lot of pressure off me. I don't have to know everything. Like a good whiskey takes 10 years, six years, four years to age. I can take that amount of time to become the ambassador that I need to be. And uh, to, because I know that this job's not gonna be over next year, you know, this is a long play for our company. It was good for me, so. By the way, I like, uh, Jack is getting jealous that we're all drinking whiskey. <laughs> so he moves. <laughs> yeah, there we go. The house. So um, I see you got the old, uh, yeah. uh, old, old uh, bottle and oh, bottle. Yeah. There, I might join you. What are you drinking there, Jigs? What are you drinking? What do you got, buddy? Burden House. Yeah, I started a while ago with Georgia Moon also, but now I moved on to nice. Burden nice. House. Yeah. So, so, so let me ask you all about Georgia. Oh, what is this? Virgin Bourbon? Oh, yeah. There you go. Oh. Yeah, please, uh, Bernie, go ahead. So, um, Georgia Moon, you know, that's not something we really push or bring up, but, you know, um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a fascinating story. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. it is it in the Philippines. Uh, do, do people drink it in the Philippines, or do you all just have it because it's uh, it's on your bar? So, we uh, we are pushing it now. Um, mm -hmm. I am making it a point yeah. to push um, Georgia Moon corn whiskey because it's something different. There's a sweetness behind it. I mean, yeah. how often do you find something that's fifty proof? Uh, sorry, hundred proof, fifty percent alcohol. You could drink neat, room temperature. And it doesn't burn. Yeah. yeah, it has that alcohol pepperiness, but it's not astringent by any means. Yeah, don't put your nose in and take a <laughs> That's, that's going to blow your nostrils out a little yeah. bit. Man, I mean, Jigs, you, uh, you have it. You just got it yeah. recently. What, what is your opinions on it, buddy? Yeah. There you go. Uh, I think corn whiskey is one of the subcategories of American whiskeys that is most ignored not, not deliberately but i think people's attention here in the philippines are focused on like other american whiskey categories like yeah. bourbon or weighted or rye 
So it's one of the more unknown ones. But, th but this George Moon, yeah, I have to agree, agree with you, Frank. Yeah, it, it goes yeah. down so easy. I love the sweetness behind it. Uh, I gotta admit, so, though, when I first tried it, uh, there was a very interesting note that shocked me, I guess because of its being unaged. Yeah. So it, it's something yes. I'm not used to. But later on, the, the sweetness at the back really, really grows on you. I'm it's telling really you. Enjoyable, yeah. Once you go down that, um, that I call it uh, new make or distill it rabbit yes. hole, you yes. want to keep on drinking. I'm a big fan of new make. Whenever a yeah. uh, some type of representative I know is coming in, especially if I, uh, I per I'm personally friends with them, like bring me some new make. Whether it's scotch or what, bring me new make. 68% <laughs> even better. Bring me new make. I'm telling That's you. But does, does your jar of Georgia Moon, does it say age less than 30 days on it? It does. Yes. It's, yes. It is an older, um, it is an older uh, one. Yeah. Just got well, if it says that, it's it's untrue. It's never been aged. So it is. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, it is. And uh, <laughs> so when you look at, uh, when you look at the, uh, at, at corn whiskey, like unaged corn whiskey, and this is not a moonshine, it is a true corn whiskey. So corn whiskey has laws like bourbon. Right. It has to be made just like bourbon. You know, bourbon has to be at least 51% corn. Corn whiskey has to be 80, at least 80%. Yeah, uh, but they both need to be distilled at lower proofs, so uh, can't be distilled over 160 proof. And we bring everything off at 135 to 138 proof, so it still has the same stringent laws. Um, George, whis uh, corn whiskey is the only whiskey that doesn't have to be aged because if you do age corn whiskey, if so, that means you do not. So that's why Georgia Moon is around. You do not have to age corn uh, corn whiskey. It must be aged in a used charred barrel or a brand new uncharred barrel. So the way I look at Georgia Moon and the way I use Georgia Moon, and Justin probably told you this, uh, is, but um, the um, uh, look at it like uh, Blanco tequila. Mm -hmm. so it, is, it is the equivalent of Blanco tequila. So it is really not new make. It has been had pure water added to it to get it down to that 100 proof. And they jack over there it's, uh, in the jar, it's the 100 proof version uh, in the United oh. States. It's proof uh, here but they have Whoa. that uh, oh. we, do have, we do have a hundred proof version in the united states but it's uh, it comes in a bottle a uh, tall round oh interesting oh, okay yeah yeah but the, you know because they want to show that history and heritage of the uh, the mason jar yeah uh, we yeah. use that for the international and plus you can short fill a international bottle to, to for a 70 centiliter or 700 milliliter and uh and it doesn't look as short as a uh, short fill as a, cause it, it's a, that's a 750 uh, it jar. It is, a, yeah. Yes, it is. A. Uh, but uh, sometimes, but anyway, that's the business side of it, which gets yeah. boring. But the, um, uh, so I, when I first came to Heaven Hill and I was like, oh my God, I've got all these great whiskeys to taste. And where do I start? How do I do a tasting? So I looked at Georgia Moon and I went, wow. That's what Evan Williams was making in Louisville, Kentucky in 1783 on the banks of the Ohio River. Yeah. He wasn't making bourbon. He was making high, high content corn whiskey. Yeah. So that, so that, that's the genesis yeah. of what American bourbon became. Right? But in 1700s, there it is. That's the start. That's corn whiskey. It wasn't made from rye like, like the whiskeys in the United States that were from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New York. And then Canada had rye whiskey. It wasn't the barley-based whiskeys from Scotland and Ireland. Right. Is the genesis of what bourbon was going to become. Yeah. So yeah. that is the start of my what I call my evolution of bourbon tasting. So you start with yeah. what Evan Williams was making, what Elijah Craig was making in 1789, what Basil Hayden was making in 1882, and what Jacob Bean was making in 1895, 1795 you start with unaged corn whiskey. Yeah. And in the early 1800s, they were taking that same corn whiskey, putting it into barrels, putting it on, on, on Kentucky longboats going down the Ohio River to St. Louis and then New Orleans. And it would age in those barrels that they had burned the inside of the barrels out. Yeah. Whiskey. And then you get the second evolution, which Keep is- going. Mm -hmm. Keep so going. that is the same exact whiskey as Georgia Moon, 
but aged in a, in a used charred barrel, a once used Evan Williams barrel for four years. Yeah. So that's the, the next, that is the next evolution of getting towards where bourbon, so I love mellow corn so much, you know, we, I call people who love, it's, a, it's got a big bartender following in the United States and internationally. Um, I call people who love mellow corn children of the corn. And, uh, <laughs> This is the only, this is the, uh, this is the, this is a phone case. Oh, that's yeah. great. Oh. It's just a label on a clear case. We don't have a big budget for advertising for Mellow Corn. Um, but it's a, uh, it, when I put that phone down on the bar, bartenders go, oh, Mellow Corn. So you know, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a hello, right? Yeah. And so I say that uh, this is the, this is the missing link to bourbon. This is the, fish that crawls out of the lake onto the ground this yeah. is this, this thing to show us where we're going towards bourbon because this is what people would write back from new orleans and say hey keep using those charred barrels it adds a lot of flavor to it so because it's in a used barrel just like 200 years ago but that's just the law of corn whiskey how it has to be aged and the reason it's in a used charred barrel is that uh, so that the corn flavor remains if we, if we age that Georgia moon and put that into a brand new charred oak barrel, we'd have Evan Williams. Yep. So we want something different. Now their recipes are a little bit different, but still they would be the same. Yeah. So great, great tasting is to have the Georgia moon and then see what a used charred barrel does, right? And most whiskeys of the world, Johnny Walker's, okay? Um, any blended scotches, any blended Irish, any blended uh, uh, Canadian whiskeys, they're all in a used charred barrel. True. So it brings the life with that. And then if you taste Evan Williams bottle and bond right next to that, after, after you taste Georgia Moon, Mellow Corn, and Evan Williams bottle and bond, that is the same whiskey aged in a brand new charred barrel. So you just showed uh, in, in, a, in a simple flight you just brought to life the story of how bourbon became bourbon from unaged corn whiskey in the late 1700s to aged corn whiskey in the early 1800s to bottle and bond bourbon would have been in 1890 in 1897 or the early 1900s you just brought that story to life and now if you want to throw in rittenhouse rye and have it the same and the and then and that's that's bottle and bond rye whiskey yeah so just brought to life too. What is the difference between corn whiskey, bourbon whiskey, and rye whiskey? And it's a good comparison because they're all four years old. They're all 100 proof. It's awfully hard to taste somebody on an 80 proof four year old rye and then compare it to a four year old or a six year old 100 proof bourbon. You don't know the exact difference, but if they're the same exact age and the same exact proof, you know exactly. So then you can, with those four, that tasting of four whiskeys, you just showed people the difference between unaged corn whiskey, aged corn whiskey in a used barrel, bourbon in a brand new charred barrel, and rye whiskey, American rye whiskey in a brand new charred oak barrel. And did it very simply in a mind blowing way that they will always be able to reference and go, I know, I can describe you the difference between American corn whiskey, American bourbon, and American rye because I just did it with Frank and Jigs. Yeah, that's so true. And Jigs, sorry, you didn't get a sample of that because literally it just came in from the docks. So we are having that now. It, we ran out a year ago and we just, we requested to get it back. We have it back. So don't worry, you're gonna taste some. Now, and I'll show you where the evolution uh, comes in with Larceny and Old Fitzgerald and when we get to that. Yeah, no, actually let's, uh, let's get into that because the reason why I even have um, old Fitzgerald is I, I, I like to joke how whiskeys come to perish in the Philippines. You know, uh, <laughs> before, it, uh, like, people would just dump old stocks in the Philippines. You know, oh, these guys, oh, they'll take it. They're going to get it at a low price. No big deal. And we did. So, the, like, these the, – I have actually one, two – and the 1849 old fish. Oh, nice. Yeah. And you don't have that anymore. Can you here. send me can you send me a bottle of that? <laughs> <laughs> I might Where are we going to the Philippines, Bernie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we gonna come. Um so we have this, right? So 
when old fits, like when people found out they weren't making it anymore, everyone in the Philippines, right? This was a hidden gem. These old, oh, yeah. you know, they were hidden gems. We were like, oh my God. Oh yeah. They're like, oh, oh, it went into larceny. Well, larceny wasn't here. Sure. Literally, we have it now. We, mm -hmm. we demanded where we need larceny. This mm -hmm. is the Filipinos and Jigs, you know, back me up. I think you will. They love sweet. Oh, yeah. So weeded whiskey oh, yeah. is great. Like, the, it, I think it, for me, it matches the Filipino palate. Now, some people may argue with me because I'm only half Filipino, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> I think it does. So for me, I think larceny is going to be a great match. Can you talk about the evolution, as you were saying, of old Fitzgerald into larceny? Because, and why the Philippines? Why Filipinos should get excited for this? I know I am. Uh, you look, look at me. I have goosebumps. Why they should oh be God. excited for this? That's awesome. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this one over to Jack because you know Jack being from Georgia, yeah. and uh, his father was a, uh, a, a Scotch man. I think his dad's drinking more bourbon now too. But the uh, yeah, uh, Jack can tell you because I've just kind of told you about you know some of these. Cool thing too is you know that's a very historic label. We haven't changed that label since 1945. So <laughs> look at that and say, oh my God, why don't you update that, make it more modern? Well, why would you change history and all those old Fitzgerald labels? We've never changed those labels, right? But that was yeah. one of the problems is it wasn't selling because uh, you know it, it got lost with all the small badges and the Knob Creeks and the Woodford Reserves and the Russell Reserve that stuff. You know, look modern and sleek, and you're spending forty and fifty dollars for a bottle. It has to look like it's worth that. Uh, so Jack and I come from the same kind of, I don't want those new sleek labels. I want that old, ugly, historic label. Give me that one every single time, right? And I think that's probably one reason why Filipinos fell in love with Old Fitzgerald and even that prime bottle because, you know, we this is the same label that uh, was, was, you know, before Prohibition. So oh, wow. That, you know, it just never changes anything. If we buy the brand... There's no reason to invest money to change that. We're, we're really not trying to push this brand. We're just trying to, uh, you know, to, to fill demand, you know, and then, you know, we're trying to push Evan, uh, you know, Evan Williams. Uh, now, if this happens to become the next Evan Williams, that's amazing. That's great, you know, but it's not, you know, you, you got to pick one. But, but because uh, Jack, um, I'll just turn this over to Jack and uh, just because he's got history with this and he tells a good story and he tells yeah. the story real well and, yeah, so like like I said, um, I, I was on mute here a little bit when my son was running in and out, um, make sure I'm not. Um, you know, like I said, uh, back 30 minutes or so ago, when we acquired the old Fitzgerald brand in 1999, Parker Beam and Craig Beam had never made weeded bourbon before. So it was exactly what Bernie just said. You know, it was, uh, and I've, I just have some lawnmowers coming on behind me. Let me know if it's too loud and I'll, I'll move back into another space. Um, if you, if you can hear that stuff behind me. So Parker and Craig really just wanted to focus on, like, like Bernie said, meeting the demand for the old Fitzgerald in the places where it was, um, where it was already being sold. And, you know, again, if it was with the resurgence of, you know, the Russell's reserves and all the small batches and single barrels and all that, we sort of saw the need and the, the, the need for something like that in the weeded bourbon space. And um, the same year that we had acquired the Old Fitzgerald brand, the true story of who Old Fitzgerald actually was um, came out in um, a book that a woman named Sally Van Winkle Campbell had, has written. That, that name may sound a little familiar to you because Sally is the granddaughter of Julian Pappy Van Winkle, um, who is one of the folks, if not the man, that really, really made and popularized the brand Old Fitzgerald, especially in the 20th century. And when Pappy Van Winkle and the Sissel Weller Distillery owned the Old Fitzgerald brand, they continued selling the brand on the story that Old Fitzgerald was, and John Fitzgerald was his, was his true name, but Old Fitzgerald was the, was the greatest palate in the distillery, maybe in Bourbon County, maybe in Kentucky. And any of the barrels that he had been tasting, those were the ones that were going immediately into the bottles labeled Old Fitzgerald. 
Well, the story that Sally details in the book, um, Always Find Bourbon, the story of Pappy Van Winkle and John Fitzgerald, details that yes, John Fitzgerald did work at the distillery, but he did not work for the distillery. He worked for the US government um, in the treasury department and he was actually the bondsman there in charge of making sure that the distillery was paying all the government all of its proper uh, taxes and monies owed um, measuring the gauges of the barrels as they went into the warehouses to age and as they came out of the bar barrel warehouses to get dumped and as a part of that job he was the only one that had keys to give him basically unfettered access to the warehouses and the rick houses at any time of day so old Johnny was sneaking in in the middle of the night, stealing sips from not just the best barrels, but all the barrels, therefore committing larceny. <laughs> so uh, think, about, think about all those bottles that you have on your shelf uh, looking across from you and downstairs, as you said, Frank, and think about all the stories that you hear and uh, whether it be American whiskey, Scotch whiskey, Indian whiskey, Japanese whiskey, et cetera. A lot of those stories are great. A lot of them are truth. A lot of them have some truth. And a lot of them, well, a lot of them have come up in, in boardrooms as well, right? Found their origination in, in boardrooms from marketing teams. How amazing is it to be able to create a brand based on a true story that is, is nuts and quote unquote wild west, if you will. I mean, Imagine jo imagining Johnny Fitzgerald sneaking in in the middle of the night, si stealing sips from barrels with a whiskey thief is like, I can close my eyes and I can see the Hollywood movie, right? With John Wayne as, as playing John Fitzgerald. <clears throat> so that was the, that was the origin story of the brand and our Johnny Fitzgerald larceny, as I call it, um, was launched in 2012. Um, and its purpose from go was to be our sort of, the new engine, if I can use that term, Bernie, to pull the train of the Fitzgerald brand and legacy. Um, and we launched it in six markets in the United States in 2012. Um, in 2018, um, it finally became a fully distributed product throughout the U.S. And then it sounds like uh, it is now making its way um, in, in, into some international markets, which is really, really amazing. I mean, we haven't really touched on this too much, but so much of what we do at Heaven Hill um, really focuses on the U.S. and the North American market. And we've got so much work to do, which is really exciting to spread the love, the knowledge, the word of Heaven Hill throughout the throughout the world. So it's really exciting being a part of programs like this and talking to folks, especially as um, larceny is hitting the market. I mean, it, it sounds like I think you just said it. It just arrived on the docks. Yeah. Um, again, I can, I can close my eyes and I can picture the Hollywood movie of the, of the cases arriving on the docks. It's so cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, being that I'm based in the Bay Area, I actually reached out to a couple of um, Filipino bartending friends, Mary Palak, who's down in San Jose um, at Paper Plain, is a good friend. And she's just a rising superstar in the, in the bar industry, um, I guess globally. Um, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be on this program tomorrow and they're, they're curious about what whiskeys are, are going to be good for the Filipino palate. And I'm like, I'm not Filipino. The only, um, the only access I have to the Filipino market and the palate was when my dad would come back there from doing business in the eighties and bringing me mango concentrate, a little brand <laughs> called Mango Tango that we used to put on our Briars vanilla ice cream. Um, and she was like, well, you're, you're you know, you're, you're sort of spot on. The, the palate is, we like sweet. Uh, we like tropical. And I said, well, when you're talking about whiskeys, she's like, you know, I haven't been back in a number of years, but Amer it's from what I hear, American whiskeys are really starting to make way. And, and, and the Heaven Hill portfolio, you know, the, the ones that I love and think would be great over there are uh, Melcorn, which we just talked about. I didn't know that y'all had, I didn't know that y'all had Georgia moon over there. So that one obviously fits in as well too. Um, and then larceny and our Bernheim wheat whiskey. I don't know if y'all have that over oh, there, but we made sure. Oh, not great. I, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, if, if, if the general population of the Philippines is, is starting out um, making a conversion from gin drink, gin based drinks, rum based drinks, tropical drinks, 
and they want to get into um, American whiskeys, you know, Ber the term that Bernie and I have actually coined for Bernheim, um, we, every now and again sitting in a bar, is, is training wheels whiskey. Yeah. Because it is, it's very approachable. I don't mean that in a negative sense no. at all. Um, Bernheim is so darn approachable, and then it plays so nicely as you ramp up into larceny. Similar mash bills, you know, Bernheim is 51% wheat and 37% corn, 14% um, or 12% malted barley, and then larceny is 68% corn, 20% wheat, probably the most wheat of any wheated bourbon out there, actually. Um, but they, they, they present themselves as sort of a nice ramp up into the bourbon category. And at 90 proof at Bernheim, especially if you're Georgia Moon is 100 proof, you know, you're starting at 90 proof with Bernheim, you're getting in nice and, for the most part, nice and easy, ramping it up to 92 with Larceny, um, and then your Malicorn uh, and your Georgia Moons at, at 100 proof. I mean, that's a, that's a heck of a flight there to, to really show um, the breadth of what American whiskey can be, and then to be totally humble, the expertise of what we're doing, what Connor O'Driscoll and our team um, at Heaven Hill are doing, um, at our distillery in Louisville and, and then our aging facilities out in, out in Bardstown. You know, for me, you know, when, you know, before I started selling, I was always pushing American whiskey. Why? I would say it's, it's the same quality, but half the price and it's sweeter, you know, like for the Filipino palate compared to scotches, right? You, you get a 12 year old scotch, eh, it's okay. It's like getting a six-year-old American whiskey because of you got the heat, you know, the, the fluctuations in the heat and all that. So I've been pushing American whiskey for a while. And now I'm just so happy that something that is being brought to the forefront and Filipinos are taking notice. And, you know, Bernheim, I don't know why it, it isn't more popular. I'm so happy that I'm pushing it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm just excited. I'm really excited. I mean, I'm glad you're excited. I'm yeah. Glad you're excited. yeah you, know, um, you know, um, you all heard of the brand IW Harper because it was big over in the Asian market uh, for so many years. And that's a brand that still uh, uh, Diageo still owns and yeah. still has. Well, IW is Isaac Wolf, and uh, that is his first two initials, and his last name is Bernheim. So, uh, so that's what our distillery is named after because we bought the distillery from that company in 1999, oh. and that's when we got the old and that's when we got the old Fitzgerald brand. That's who owned that brand. So that's when we acquired that brand, and so uh, Bernheim really came to be the very first time that Craig Bean, uh, Parker's son, made Bernheim wheat whiskey was when he was making his first batch of old Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's how unpopular Old Fitzgerald was in the United States. We bought the brand in 1999, and we didn't have to make it for the first time to put up for four years ahead until 2001, right? Wow. So, so that's how much people stopped drinking of Old Fitzgerald because at the time it was just all about small batches. And, you know, and I mean, at that time, small batches – was what everybody was concentrating on because that's where the money was for yeah. the company. Yeah. They were cutting off brands like Old Fitzgerald and it had been bastardized for so long from a couple different companies that owned it. So all those cool brands that we were acquiring, right? And that's why we looked at Old Fitzgerald as one of the uh, crown jewels of the bourbon world. And to think that it was just discarded like a baseball card and just traded off like it was nothing, right? Uh, to uh, you know, because they didn't care about it, because they were too busy building uh, what they were going to make bullet something, and John, of course, they had Johnny Walker and everything else to worry about. So who cares about old Fitzgerald? Well, Max Shapiro did, right? So he he bought it and uh, did that, and so Craig's making it for the first time, and so he's never made. It's no, there's no difference in making a wheat bourbon than a rye bourbon. You're just using a different ingredient, and that's yeah. it's not like rye whiskey where you got a little extra. And they had that expertise for rye whiskey, but 
So, but he did make a mistake. And sometimes mistakes, good things come from, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we only had three bins. So we have a corn bin, you have a rye bin and a barley bin. And that's where you, you know, grind your grains. And so he had already ground up all this wheat for old Fitzgerald, but then he ground up too much. And he had already made all the barrels, all the, all the gallons, the fruit gallons that he needed for Old Fitzgerald. And he had this wheat that was already ground up, so he couldn't send the wheat back, right? It was, it was, so he already ground it up. And so sitting in a bin, and he knew that, in a, you know, that in, 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 within the hour, that bin needed to be filled with rye and making Evan Williams again. So he's kind of under the gun. And uh, so I heard Craig tell the story. <clears throat> he says, well, you know, um, uh, they say I'm supposed to be innovative. So uh, he goes, uh, so um, I figured if I got this wheat, I can, uh, I can just make a wheat whiskey. So uh, he says, uh, so I went over and you know, at the time, you know, rye whiskey was not popular at all. Uh, but he goes, hey, everybody seems like our Rittenhouse rye. You know, he has a real thick accent. Uh, it's about our Rittenhouse rye. So he had to go look up the recipe for Rittenhouse rye, right? Because <laughs> they they made it so little, and um, and all he knew is it needed to be at least you know to be a wheat whiskey. It had to be fifty one percent, but that's what the recipe was for rye whiskey for our rye whiskey. He goes, so I just use that recipe. Yeah. So uh, he did that uh, and used that. He put a little bit more um, uh, uh, corn in it because he didn't need the extra barley in it like you do with the to break the enzymes down and uh, yeah. so that's what the recipe is so on the fly in the middle of a production run he creates and brings back a whole category of whiskey that's never been there since the since prohibition and that's when uh, so when it came out they named it Bernheim because that's the name of the distillery and when Mr. Bernheim was making I.W. Harper um, that was back in the 1800s, and unfortunately, because of the bigotry of the day in the United States, you did not want to put a Jewish name on a label. It would not sell. Right, of course. So he put his first two initials, Isaac Wolf, I.W., on the, on the label, and his, because he's in Kentucky, and like myself and Jack, he's a horse race fan, because we have the Kentucky Derby here and all that, so he put his favorite... Um, uh, horse trainer uh, John Harper, and he used that last name uh, for his whiskey. So I W Harper was born, and uh, so now because our family's Jewish that owns us, the yeah. Shapiro family, we're proud to put Mr. Bernheim's name on a label, and we think that he would be very proud to see his name on a label. Yeah. And so it's a it's it's a cool story of how serendipity and luck and just you know having to empty a bin can create a whole category of whiskey that was never there before and it would take a family-owned company to do that by the way yeah of course amazing now i want to pivot a little bit though i want to know more mm -hmm. about you guys now mm -hmm. covid we're all being affected right sure. now just a few you know let, let's just uh, ask a few different things uh and you know you two jigs just jump in Actually, let's start with you, Jake. You know, um, during COVID, right, we're all doing silly things. We're all doing something different that we've never done before. For example, when right before COVID started, I had just this, you know, nice beard, you know, just a kind of a just a scruff. Then I was like, oh, I'm in quarantine. The Philippines went deep quarantine. You're really not allowed out. So, all right. I said, I'm going to grow a COVID beard my, for a corn. So my beard went down to here. It was crazy. Then when we went from regular, they, we called it in, uh, modif or modified enhanced quarantine. That was full, almost full lockdown. Once we went to general quarantine, trust me, this is all silly stuff. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to have, still have my, I'm going to go back to my slight beard but I'm going to have this ridiculous mustache as ridiculous as possible. I mean, I cannot take myself seriously when I have this must, when I have this thing, that's why I have it. I'm making fun of myself. What, 
what kind of quirks have you done since this whole thing started? Uh, Jigs, why don't you start, buddy? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, well, similar to Frank, there was a moment where, you know, since work didn't really allow us to grow out a scruff and all that stuff, you know, I tried it out, but then that also helped me see that, you know, it's not in my genes. <laughs> you know, I'm not really meant to grow that kind of beard. So, you know, I took it off. But as for what changes quarantine made, I think the level of effort and the level of time you put online, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. The, the kind of energy that Zoom calls would demand <laughs> compared to being in with people, right, in person. It's different, yeah, very much different. But you know, over time, we, we've all learned to uh, work around it, get used to it. Uh, I think that's that's largely what we're entering into now. Zach? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I totally agree with Jigs. I mean, I, the amount of, yeah. there's a program that we, that we use within Heaven Hill um, that I didn't even know I had on my computer is Microsoft Teams, which is, you know, another form mm -hmm. of video conferencing. And I had never used it except maybe once or twice leading up to COVID. And now it's like, it's all I do everything on it. It's been great, actually, because, you know, the folks that are back in Kentucky that I don't get to see very often, I, you know, I now can just open that up and have a quick little video chat. And um, you sort of, you almost get to know each other um, again in a, in a lot better way, which I think is yeah. really cool. Um, I think it's shown how, how versatile and flexible everyone can be, um, again, which is a, a definite positive. Um, and then, you know, I, I just got rid, I stopped getting hair. I just got started getting haircuts every three weeks and taking it all off. I had a full head of hair and now I just, I just do that because it's much easier. I don't have to worry about going to a barber shop, and yeah. my wife can do it. And there you go. Nice. I mean, we both, we both do need to go have a very stiff drink after she gives me a haircut because we disagree on how my hair could, should be cut, but anyway. <laughs> She's, she's laughing in the background. That's great. That is great. <laughs> well, this is what I did. I bought a new guitar. Nice. Uh, and I've, uh, I've actually written a couple of songs during lockdown and uh, been able to uh, do more. But this is uh, working on my Kentucky thumb picking, uh, Merle Travis uh, thumb picking and Kentucky nice. picking. <clears throat> and that's one, no, one thing I do is I bring the tastings alive with them. Um, uh, that evolution of bourbon tasting, you know, where we do the Georgia Moon, Mellow Corn, yeah. Larceny to show how uh, wheat came into the equation because it's a winter grain. And the reason that there's very few uh, wheat bourbons on the market is that you would probably only use wheat when uh, during the winter time when you're making your beer and your whiskey. And then you'd go back to rye when because rye would be uh, rye is also a winter grain, but corn is only a summer grain. So, you know, you, you need to. To, to, so that's how, that's one reason why there's very few uh, wheat products out there. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, show that. And then uh, that, that bring it, I bring the whole tasting alive with live bluegrass music yeah. and Kentucky music. And uh, Bill Monroe, the father, father of the country of uh, bluegrass music is from Rosine, Kentucky. And uh, Bill and Merle Travis is from Muhlenberg County, Kentucky. And and he had this thumb picking style that he did, but it was all influenced by kind of the uh, the black gospel uh, players and pickers and the you know the Delta Blues three yeah. finger kind of things you know. And then Merle Travis made it into his own. So I've just been obsessed uh, with that and learning new new thumb picking songs and uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's just uh, to me, it's just uh, I mean I'm sure my neighbors. I live in a condo, so my neighbors upstairs are hating me because I'll just. Be, <laughs> Over and over and over, but that's how you learn the song, right? Can we hear a little ditty, man? I mean, I've, I've read about you. I've read about your bluegrass. I mean, can we hear something from you, Bernie? You just said the magic word, Frank. <laughs> Pilgrim and 
like a stranger traveling through this worrisome land. I've got a home in the yonder city, good Lord, and it's not made by hand. I've got a mother, sister, and a brother who have gone. That sweet show. I am determined to go see them, good Lord, over on the other shore. And he picks it like this. sixties, you know, so when I hear some music like that, it's been so long since I heard anything live. And this is something that I enjoy. Oh you God, really yeah. made, you know, you really made me smile. And you doing this, thank you, Bernie. Wow. I cannot, I mean, that's amazing. I yeah. You music want to hear a real bluegrass? You want to hear a real bluegrass, right? Hey. There you go. That was that was thumb picking, but this is bluegrass here. This is a Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs song called Just Ain't. I ain't gonna worry who's kissing you when I'm far away. I know when the Tomcat's gone, all the mice will play. Ain't gonna worry what's going on when you're out to paint the town. Ain't gonna worry where you stay when you're out running around. I just ain't. I just ain't. Just ain't. Ain't gonna care what you do when I'm home sleeping in bed. Ain't gonna mind if you're sin, gonna sleep instead. Ain't gonna follow you when you go walking down the street. Ain't gonna care who's the other guy that you go to meet. I just ain't. Just ain't, just ain't. Ain't gonna care if you don't come back, I'll get along all right. Ain't gonna mind it living alone, and I'll still sleep at night. Ain't gonna worry where you go, and when you say goodbye. Find me someone else to love. I ain't gonna sit and cry. I just ain't. I just ain't. I just ain't. Wow. Bluegrass for you, right there. You play like this in uh, in all your tastings, Bernie. Uh, where will it lends itself? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work for every group, but we found that. Mm -hmm. it, that it works really great for like bourbon societies mm. and uh, people with an extra uh, bartenders. We do it every year at the Camp Runamuck here, oh, which is great. 200 bartenders come in twice a year and do it. It's uh, really fun. And uh, it's really fun when I get to have my uh, bluegrass uh, picking friends uh, that uh, play banjo and uh, dobro oh, and uh, 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 mandolin and that and bass oh. guitar. I mean, we have the whole band, but I'm doing it, doing it in a couple weeks down in Owensboro, Kentucky for a bourbon society. But it kind of brings the story to life, and then and, and, uh, through music, and it's, uh, it's some a passion of mine. So I like to to do it. it kind of, awesome. I, I think it's fun. Jack, uh, do you have a signature? Right, like Bernie, comedian. <laughs> uh, you know, he has his bluegrass. You, everyone has, usually has a signature, right? Like me, 
I'm always wearing a hat. And right now, apparently, the big thing in my whiskey society is a Frank pour, which went from having a big drink to all of a sudden filling up all the way to the top. Oh, and my it, goodness. Yeah, you think the glass? Yeah, we just saw someone today do That's a nice. Frank pour on a margarita glass. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm not saying that should be anyone's signature, but what is when you're going out and going doing doing things what is your signature uh man well i i my my one signature is very similar to yours i'm always wearing a hat these are uh this yeah. is an evan williams this is actually an, an evan williams hat oh, and i hat. i designed i designed these and uh we've got an evan williams hat a pikesville hat a heaven hill distillery hat and soon to be launching a rittenhouse hat so I'll put a little, I'll put a box in the mail uh, once I have the written house hat, and I'll send you guys a, a couple of them probably in a couple of months. Love it. We're supposed um, to have those mellow ports coming out soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. We do. I forgot about those. Um, those are going to be exciting. Um, and I would say my my signature drink that I I don't know if I'm known for it. I mean, I, it's what I get when I go out as a Boulevardier. I, I drink um, a lot of either an Elijah Craig Boulevardier or a Melicorn Boulevardier. Um, and, and there you go. I, I have, <clears throat> I would say that's probably a good recommendation for your audience because I think the Boulevardier has a good bit of sweetness while it has a good bit of bitterness, but I, ha I have switched my, my, my go-to a little bit actually just to reduce the sweetness for myself into more of a, a neat pour and a, a cider back. I don't know if you guys have cider over in the Philippines. Um, but it's a, it's a great way to, to, uh, to spend a, spend a few, a few hours at a bar, which I can't wait till we get back. Here's another one day. of my signatures. I have a bottle and bond tattoo. Yes. Uh, wow. Got the flames and the barrel and everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's sweet. That's uh, actually, that was, a, that, was, that was a great um, answer, Jack, because obviously cocktails are big. And it's a great way to introduce people to whiskey maybe later on you know they're drinking a cocktail now they want to drink it um neat uh bernie do you have a signature cocktail you like to go you like to do or are you or are you just like you know what? i'm drinking it neat i'm drinking it hard i mean what's your thing man <laughs> jack i'll tell you when i go into any cocktail bar or thing and i sit down with my mellow corn uh, phone right yeah and I say they have mellow corn um i'll i'll, I'll first uh, Tell them to you know show you know, make me what you what do you make with mellow corn because I always like to do uh, mellow corn eats a lot in cocktails as much as it as it should be yeah. uh, which is great because it has a lot of opportunity for so many women and they go what do you like to drink and I'm like go well, make me a paloma but use mellow corn instead of tequila and uh, and it's it's just a wonderful drink and then of course they'll take you know they'll take a, a, a sipping straw and taste it and go oh my god that's so good. And next thing you know, the next time I come back, it's on their menu, you know. So uh, it's, uh, I just love that drink. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, plus it uses mellow corn, which is, which is a win. But um, like I said, not that we're pushing mellow corn, but it's just exciting to see all categories and all brands being used. Yeah. I mean, mellow corn is so underrated. Right? You know, when people see it, the, the part, and part of it is obviously the old fashioned label. People are like, oh, what is this? What is this stuff? Mellow corn. So no, that's great. I'm so glad to have it. Um, yeah, and that's and that's the response when we bring it in and introduce to someone is it's either, oh my God, what is that, or oh my God, what is that, and usually the <laughs> latter of those two turns into the first one after they taste it. Yeah, right. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I th well, we've gone about an hour and a half. I think uh, we're about ready to call it as far as the recording portion. Well, let's talk a few minutes afterwards. Jigs, we can do this wanna... again sometime. Huh? We can do this again sometime too. Yeah. 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 Actually, um, yeah, I want to ask you a question Zoom afterwards. Um, we can zoom in. Now we're like superheroes. I always think of myself as a superhero of bourbon. If you can zoom in to anywhere in the world and do a tasting. Yes. What, what time is it in the Philippines right now? It is 10.40 in, yeah. the, in the evening. So until uh, daylight savings happens, we're exactly 12 hours ahead, ahead of, of, the East Coast. of East Coast US. This is yeah. how- then you, can, 
then you can tell us what stocks to buy. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for me, that's how I've learned to how to differentiate the time because you know I'm a West Coast guy though. You know I'm, I'm right. So I'm like, all right, it is. That means I'll be like, all right, it's 9 a.m. in the in the Philippines. That means it's 9 p.m. in the U.S. Three hours behind, or three hours is 6 p.m. All right, that's what time it is in L.A. Or depending on daylight savings, Arizona. So it's mm -hmm. that's how you always think about 12 hours or 13 hours, depending if if people are still doing daylight savings. Which let's not get into right. that. That's a whole different discussion. Um, right. But uh, Jigs, did you want to ask? One one last thing before we just stop the recording. I have a few minutes to talk. Oh, um, I, I learned that you guys have uh, three different main facilities for Evan Hill. You have the uh, distillery, and then you have uh, the warehouse in Bardstown. Am I right? And uh, the artisanal distillery also. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what what how did that happen that your warehouse far away from the main distillery? And what what does the artisanal distillery do? Because I know it, it makes only a small amount of new make every month, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so is it something you dedicate for experiments? Or uh, what is that distillery about also? Yeah, well, great. Well, I'll, I'll, be, down, I'll, I'll be down there later today uh, with our <laughs> artisanal distiller, uh, Jody Filiatru. Um, uh, but anyway, our, our distillery was of course on the main site, which was William Heaven Hill's farm. And that's why we're mm -hmm. called Heaven Hill. It was the name of the gentleman who owned the farm and uh, the property we, we bought. Uh, but in 1996, there was a, let's see if you can see this. Oh yeah, the giant oh. fire. Yeah. Okay. There was a catastrophic fire. Oh. You can, uh, it's, it's a lot of, refle here we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. so, oh, that's huge. Um, we lost the distillery and seven rick houses because one of the, uh, the uh, rick houses was uh, struck by lightning and caught on fire. Jeez. And you can just see how devastating that was. So uh, that's why the distillery burned down there. And um, they were so, uh, the distillery grounds was. Uh, uh, an opportunity, it costs a lot of money to build a distillery. So it, it uh, because the bourbon was so depressed in the late 90s, Max Shapiro was able to purchase a, a state-of-the-art distillery in downtown Lowell. And then all you had to do was truck it from there down to Bardstown. And that's, um, you know, as long as it works out accounting-wise and profit-wise, uh, that's why the distillery is in downtown Louisville. And uh, the facilities are down in uh, Bardstown. The Evan Williams Artisanal Distillery is part of the visitor center that's in downtown oh. for Evan Williams. So it's really not, okay. uh, you know, it's just, uh, it is a working distillery. We do have three, uh, three uh, we have a master distiller and two stillmen. Uh, so we don't, you know, we don't take it lightly. You know, we, we produce one barrel a day there and Jack can tell you because he's worked there. Uh, we, we care as much about that one barrel a day as the 1,300 barrels a day we make down the street at uh, Bernheim. Mm. Uh, it will be a product that's only available at the... Sorry, we, we, somehow we paused recordings. Apologize. No problem. Uh, so um, when you're making 1,300 barrels a day, and then, you know, uh, someone who's making two to three barrels a day, you know, it's not really uh, going to cut into your business a whole lot. So we, 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 uh, we, we look at the craft distillers as a great thing for the industry because it brings a lot of focus on the local and regional uh, pride of, a, of an area of making their whiskey, but they're never going to be able to supply the liquor shelves and the, and the shelves that the cocktail bars need at a certain price. So it's uh, really the craft, craft movement is, is very good for the industry. And we don't look at them as much as competition as we do, uh, you know, helping the rising tide raise all ships, if you will. Uh, so yeah. that's why jigs that uh, we have the different. Uh, it is the way it is, and that uh, you know Jack can tell you because he's been down at the uh, Evan Williams Artisanal Distillery. What happens? And you know, I've been there too, but it's just cool to hear it from Jack since he spent a day working with them. Just a day, but still, it's he worked a damn day there. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, as Bernie said, you know, if we were running that still in 24 hours, we, we, they, they may be able to eke out, you know, three barrels, at least at the, at the efficiencies that they use now. But I mean, it's a, it's a full shift to get that one, to get that one barrel, um, barreled, right? I mean, they, they're getting there at about seven or 8 a.m. And then by the time it's, it's 3 p.m., that's when they're, that's when they're putting it in the barrel. Um, but Jody, Will, and, and James that are down there running that are, are great guys. And it's, we're really excited because we're about seven years um, down, the, down the road from when we opened and first started running that still. So we've got some barrels that are approaching um, their seventh birthday, I think in November. Uh, middle of November is when we opened the, the Evan Williams Bourbon Experience in 2013. So we, we've been able to taste a few samples of some new make of some stuff that's aged a handful of years. Um, and it, man, they're, they're doing some amazing things. I mean, you talked Frank earlier about how much you like to try new make. Yeah. I've never tasted better new make than I've tasted coming out of that, that pot still. Um, so yeah, it, it's exciting. And you know, it, it, it really gives us a pretty good inventory of, of landmarks to, to tour around and look at, look at being the first spot that has reopened on whiskey, historic whiskey row in, in Louisville, where all of the historic distillers at one point had a, had some sort of setup. We were the first ones to come back in 2013. And then we have the, the Bernheim distillery in the Shively neighborhood of, of Louisville about, what is that? Three miles down the road, Bernie? Uh, it's actually, it's actually, uh, just just a stone's throw from Shively, but it's in the California neighborhood, believe it or not. California, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so it's just uh, it's 17th and Breckenridge, and it's probably about two, three miles as the crow, crow flies from uh, Evan Williams. And then it's, uh, what, I think it's, uh, I, I Google mapped it or, or measured it in my car. I think it's 40, like 45.3 miles yeah. or something That's from, right. um, from Bernheim out to Bardstown to the main campus of Bardstown. And then of course we have, we actually have five different warehouse locations in and around Nelson County where, Bar where Bardstown is. So we have the Heaven Hill main campus where our Bourbon Heritage Center is, which is a, a great tourist attraction, part of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Um, that's where our Heaven Hill main campus is. That's where the fire happened November 7th, mm -hmm. 1996. We have give, give or take about 20 warehouses there. Um, and then we have our Deetsville location, which has a handful of warehouses. Um, our Glencoe um, location that has a handful of warehouses. Our brand new um, Cox's Creek location where we're building about a, a new warehouse that holds close to 60,000 barrels. It's about 58,500 um, barrels. <clears throat> and then I missed one with the our Shenley location. Shenley, yeah, yeah. And the reason, James, so, is the, the reason they're in different locations like that is as the company grows and as you need land and brick houses, um, you used to be able to just buy existing ones of, of distilleries that were not that no longer were in business. And that's uh, and then now you know at the Cox's Creek because all those are gone. You and we had to. 200 acres here or 100 acres there to, and then build on the, that land. So it just, as your, in, as your needs grow, you need to uh, uh, purchase new properties and uh, for yeah, warehouse. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if uh, any of our, you know, uh, watchers and Whiskey Society members would like to tour the Heaven Hill um, distillery or whatever, what, what, what would they have to do? Because some they don't do it some it's open but it's special others you just go and you just bombard it well, how does someone get a distillery tour well it's pretty simple uh, during covid it's appointment only uh at our evan williams story downtown but even at bourbon heritage center you can just show up and uh, now you are uh, because it's covid there's less people on the tour so you might have to wait to a tour or two it's always best to go on online and uh, reserve tickets online uh, for our for our uh, visitor centers. You can go to evanhilldistillery.com and go to it from there, or you can go, just Google uh, Evan Williams Bourbon Experience or Google Bourbon Heritage Center, and then the, the websites will come up, and then you can go there and and uh, get tickets for a tour. That's the best way to do it, uh, especially. 
uh, it's good if you're coming from the Philippines, especially, but, uh, you know, then, you know, ho hopefully you, 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 uh, you, you, you call Justin and you make him arrange a great VIP insight tour for yourself. So that kind of thing. So we well, would I was hate gonna, for yeah, I was to go away, away. Yeah, uh, I was going to allude to that because. Yes, of course. <laughs> you, I mean, you're, you're always, yeah, uh, I, I wanted to come visit, you know, the States this year. Um, you know, now that, you know, before, right before COVID happened, like, all right, I'm going to visit the States. I will make a, a semi-business trip. I will go to Kentucky and I'm going to visit some brands. Heaven Hill, I'm, I'm taking over the brands. You know, I got, <laughs> I got some Elijah Craig here, but this old stuff. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I know. I love the last couple of bottles. I'm like, nope, it's mine. I'm not selling this. So we have, <laughs> have we have the small batch. Let me make sure. Yes. No, no, I know you guys have. I'm going to make sure it's oh. in the... <laughs> gotcha. It's in the Philippines. <laughs> yeah, like, wait, wait, we did get that, right? Yes. So we do have the small batch. Okay. So... Um, we know a guy who can help you if you didn't. No. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, yeah, like I said, when where whiskey comes to die is the Philippines, well, thank God, because I was able... I, I have two right. bottles that I know of, this and another one. I've been kind of hesitant on opening it because I've been drinking so much of it before. Right. I, 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 when it was so readily available, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm pouring it. It's my favorite pour. Now I'm like, Bernie, oh. we got to get out to Bardstown and start checking those shipments there, Mark, for the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> but, um, guys, uh -huh. yeah. Um, we have a lot of content. Thank you very much. I... Sure. The I'm only perfect. reason I'm stopping, because A, I don't know your schedule, but not just that, I have to eventually cut this up. So there's right, a right. lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm good. Yes. Well, you've first... got some content for a while, and we're yeah. always. Yeah, at first, COVID, I'm going to so... the whole thing out. But later, oh, I'm going to yeah. cut it. And so, oh, sure. wow, no, this has been amazing. I have. <sighs> Heaven we Hill. Got stories. We got more stories, and we can even make up some shit if we need to. No, we're gonna yeah. do. <laughs> I swear to God, we will. Um, I'm gonna stop recording. Ask you a few more questions on the side. But sure. thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. We appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Cheers, um, Frank. Jigs, thanks, thanks so much. Jigs. It's been thanks, a ton Frank. of fun. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. It made me thank so. You. This has made me so happy, guys. Good. See you on the internet. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Stay bonded, stay bonded. Stay bonded. <laughs> yes. <laughs>